title of today's message is Love Gives. And the sideline of that is Love Sacrifices. We take our text from the story in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 22. It says, Now a certain ruler asked him, asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good, not good, but that's God, that is God. Verse 20, You know the commandments. Do not, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, this young man said back to Jesus, well, all these things I've done from my youth. But then Jesus, man, he, he unpacked something huge. And this is, the, this is the premise of our message today. Verse 22, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Now, it looks like if you just lack one thing that, you know, you'd still be good, right? I mean, if, if, you, if you missed one, te- one, one question on the test of 100, you'd be feeling pretty good about that, wouldn't you? Uh, but God doesn't grade on the curve. God has a clear, concise uh, uh, way in which looking at things. And he says, you still lack one thing. And then he, man, he lays a bomb on this guy. He says, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And the young man said in verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. Now, let's, last week we looked at the story of another man who was a lawyer who asked Jesus the exact same question, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus referred him to the law just like he did this young man in this story. Both of these men asked the same question. Both of them wanted to know how to live forever. Both of them had a problem, not with the law that Jesus referred both of them to, but their problem was with love. You see, the man from last week's message had a neighbor problem. He wanted to be selective in who his neighbor was. And that, that wasn't love. The man in today's message has a value problem. They both had to keep the law of God, but neither embraced the love of God. Let's look at this man today in his story. He's known as the rich young ruler. Now, how many of you ever seen, uh, like on the signs here in town, the hospital signs where they put the names up of newborns? Have many of you ever seen that? You're at the stoplight, and it's cool to look at that. Have you ever seen a name that's like, what? Oh, come on, don't, don't I'm a, you, I'm, be honest with me. It's like, you got to be kidding. You named, you named your kid that? Really? Or, or, are you watching TV and you see so now somebody's name is like, what? Well, if, if you were going to name your son something that he's proud of, rich, young, ruler would be a pretty good name, wouldn't it? <laughs> my boy's rich, my boy's young, my boy's a ruler. Rich, young, ruler. That's an incredible name. And that's all we know him by. But the first thing we see out of his story is this, keeping the law without knowing the lawgiver. The first thing we see is an individual keeping the law, but he didn't know the lawgiver. In verse 20, Jesus says, you know the commandments. And then he names five of them. Do not commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. Now, Jesus was saying, for instance, you must keep the commandments for instance. Even though he only mentioned five commandments, he certainly was referring to all of them. Now, if I were to take a, a camera, a film camera, and a crew, and a, and a microphone, go out here on the street, anywhere in town, and interview people and say, how many commandments in the Bible? How do you believe most people would say 10? Why? Because they've heard of the 10 commandments that God wrote on stone tablets with his finger and gave them to Moses. <clears throat> By the way, God was the first to use a tablet to send a message. <clears throat> now, if you were to study Jewish history, you would discover that Jewish tradition teaches that there are 613 recorded laws in the Torah. The 613 commandments include positive commandments, which are do these things, and then negative commandments, which are do not do these things. So they're do's and don'ts. The negative commandments, number 365. So out of that number, 365 are negative commandments, which coincides with the number of days in a solar year. So in other words, there's one don't for every day of the year. And then the positive commandments, number 248, and that number is ascribed to the number of bones in a human body plus the main organs. Now, no wonder Jesus only mentioned five. However, the inference of his statement, you know the commandments, is quite clear. 
We could say that none of that applies to us today. It's certainly the traditional 613 Jewish laws don't today. In fact, some of them don't even apply to them today. But the principle of focusing on the law does apply to us today. Let me explain. See, the law was given for us to know wrong so that we could adjust our behavior to do right. However, without love, the love of God in our hearts, we cannot keep the law. In John 1, 17, we find it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice the word through. Both law and grace came from God through Moses and through Jesus. So both the law and grace came from our Heavenly Father. You know, people are the same today as they were in the day this young man asked Jesus about eternal life. We're looking for a system, a list of rules or do's and don'ts to follow that will gain us eternal life. People today want salvation by their own efforts, their own works. We, we want a formula that we can do without God's help to achieve eternal life. That's called carnality and flesh. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Instead of, instead of looking to Jesus directly, people look to a religion or a system that assures them eternal life if they'll only do certain things. If you will be baptized a certain way at a certain time, if you'll go through these certain classes, if you'll attend this, if you'll achieve this, if you'll do this, then boom, bam, bang, you're in. You're a Christian. And uh, if you'll just follow these laws at least as much as you can, then we're going to see to it that you're in heaven. Well, there's only one person that can see to it that we're in heaven, and that's the one that paid the price for us to get there. One of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a what? Gift of God. Verse 9, not of yourselves or not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now that's the New King James Version. The New uh, Living Translation makes, says it this way. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Verse 9, salvation is not a reward it's not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So you can't say, well, I checked off all these boxes on the list here, so I've earned my salvation. It doesn't work that way. You can't have salvation by working and earning it. It's not by works. It is by believing in the Lord Jesus. It's by the grace and the mercy of God that has provided a way for us to be forgiven, redeemed, born again, Say, You see, love gives. Love sacrifices. And this, this man, he's standing before Jesus. He's wanting to know about eternal life. And Jesus says, you got to keep the commandments. And he says, I got it. I am in like Flynn. I have got it. I have kept them since my youth, man. I am there. And Jesus looks at him and he sees something that nobody else sees. You see, we look on the outward and God looks on the inward. How many of you have ever, don't point at anybody, okay? How many of you have ever looked at somebody and thought, wow, they're just awesome, and you found out later that they were just awful? Have you ever looked at somebody and you're like, nah, I don't know about that person, and they turned out to be one of the most wonderful individuals you ever met in your life? You know why? Because when we looked on the outside, we had an immediate thought, an immediate kind of a judgment of, of what that person is. But once we got to know them, we found out that they either were or they were not what, we have, what they looked at. But now when Jesus looks at them, he knows immediately because he sees the heart. And he looked at the heart of this young man and he saw something there. And what he saw was what my next point is today. Misplaced value results in missed opportunity. Say that with me. Misplaced value results in missed opportunity. There was a misplaced value in this young man. You see, he valued something other than Jesus. That's why he said in verse 22, you lack one thing, son, but it was a big thing. And then Jesus put his finger on it and he, he, he tells this young man to do something incredible. He says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. Now, I don't know about you, but on the surface, that's, surface, that seems like a very unrealistic request. I mean, I mean, after all, did Jesus ask anybody else to do that? 
Mo most people recoil at the teaching of the tithe, that 10% of our income belongs to God. The reality is 100% of it belongs to God. He just allows us to bring the tithe to recognize that He is God and He is Lord, and that releases a blessing on the 90%. If we keep it all, the 100% has the curse of the planet Earth on it. But when we give a 10%, the blessing of God is released. And now Jesus is asking for all of a guy's assets. He didn't say sell 10%. The guy may have done that. He says, oh, no, no, no. Sell it all and give it away. Now, the story reveals a fact that most of us have our eyes focused on the temporary. What is ultimately temporary. And it's difficult because we, we, we live in that state of our lives. We, we look at things kind of in a temporary thing. And, and when I say temporary, 50 years is temporary. It really it is. 50 years is temporary. 100 years. 500 years is temporary compared to eternity. What was his question? The essence of his question was eternal. How can I have eternal life to live for not 100 years, or 1,000 years, or 10,000 years, or 100,000 years, or a million years, or tens of millions, or billions of trillions of years. That was his question. His question was, how can I have something that's forever? And Jesus says, get rid of something that's temporary. You see, this young man had a misplaced value. His value was on the temporary, not the eternal. He asked, what can I do to have eternal life? And the one thing that he lacked was his, was his proper value of Jesus. You see, Jesus invited this man to share his life with him by saying, come and follow me. That, that's, a, that's a rare term from Jesus. Now, he tells us to take up our cross and follow him. That's to all of us. But in the, in, the, in the terminology that he used here, he really only used it when he was calling his disciples said, come and follow me. So this, this was a unique invitation Jesus was making. Now, some theologians think that the, the man in Acts chapter 1 that was elected to take Judas' place was this rich young ruler. That he came around and recognized the value of Jesus, that he began to follow Jesus, and he became the 12th disciple to replace Judas. I, I can't substantiate that with fact, but many theologians believe it was the same individual. Be that as it may, at this moment in time, his response revealed what he valued. I want to say it again. His response revealed what he valued. It says, but when he heard this, he became very sorrowful because he was very rich. Uh, in the New King James, it says he had great wealth, had great riches. I wrote in the, in the uh, margin of my Bible, nothing is great compared to knowing Jesus. You see, he, he was making a comparison of his wealth and a relationship with Jesus. And the man was faced with a choice. I can have my wealth or I can have eternal life with a relationship with Jesus. Now, before we explore that a little further, let's stop and look at that from a rational standpoint. What would you pay for eternal life? If you could, what would you pay for eternal life? Would you give half of your income? Would you give three-fourths of your income? If somebody could come to you today and guarantee you eternal life and you didn't know Jesus and you didn't have a relationship with him, you didn't know anything about the word, and they say, I can guarantee you eternal life, what would it be worth to you? I think the rational mind, after thinking about it, it would be worth everything. Because this stuff is getting old anyway. This stuff's wearing out. This, this, stuff, this stuff's not going to last, and I'm going to die in a few years. Anyway, if I live another 50, I'm still going to die in a few years, and I'm not going to have anything. I won't have the stuff or eternal life. It'd be better to transition now and just give the stuff away. I'll build it back up, and I'm going to have eternal life. Does that sound like a rational thought? This young man thought about that. And he says, you know what? I think I'll keep my wealth instead of eternal life. Why did he do that? Because that's where his value was. Now, First of all, Jesus wasn't asking him to choose between the two. The young man didn't understand that. He was setting him up for both after he corrected his value system. Because the same Jesus that asked him to sell all he had and give the poor is the same Jesus that said in Luke 6, 38, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, press down, shaken together, running over. They'll make room for you. And pour it into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. 
In other words, he was setting him up for a multiplied blessing. You can't ever outgive God. God will, listen, God will never ask you for anything that he does not bless. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. I don't care what it is. Now, you may not get it the next day. You may not get it the next week or the next month. But if we're faithful to the Lord, if God ever asks you to sacrifice anything in your life, it's ne listen, it's never a bad trait. Because anything that you give to God, your time, your energy, your talent, or your resources, anything that you actually give to God, his principle is when you give it to me, I take it, I shake it, I bless it, I press it, and I give it back to you multiplied. The little boy brought Jesus five loaves and two fishes. After feeding everybody, his disciples carried 12 baskets back to the little boy's house. He got his fish and some more. Why? Because Jesus says it's good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Now, I realize that some preachers use that as a manipulation tool in receiving offerings. to say, if you give, God will give. You give today, God will give. Well, the principle is correct, but the heart has to be right, see? If it's just a head thing, well, okay, it's like, okay, a slot machine. I'm going to put some money in. I'm going to pull on the arm of the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus is going to give me all this money. No, it don't work that way. It's a heart thing. It's a faith issue. We worship God in our giving. And when we do it right, God promises to do what His Word says. But we don't just give to get. We give to bless. And when you give to bless, you get blessed in your life. So God was setting this boy up for an incredible financial blessing once he got his value system corrected. Because you see, the problem was he didn't have money. Money had him. See, that was the problem. He says, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Uh, keep, keep the commandments. Oh, I've done it. I'm in, man. Uh, but your heart's not right, boy. Now, I see that you value all your stuff more than you value a relationship with God. So first of all, you've got to get your value system right. And he didn't, at least not in that moment. He had great wealth. He walked away sorrowful. Why? Because he wanted to have eternal life, but he valued his wealth more. He valued his resources more. He valued whatever more. He chose the money and he chose wrong. Jesus could have said, you know what? I left heaven for you. You can't leave your stuff for me. I mean, he's probably got a three hump camel parked out in the parking lot. Nobody's got a three hump camel. Wi-Fi enabled. I mean, this guy's got it. I mean, he's got it going on. Double hemi underneath the hood there. He's got it. Jesus let's say, like, can't you leave that? I left heaven, the presence of God, the angels. I, 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 I left the glory of heaven, streets of pure gold. I left the presence of the Father to come down and live in this stinky body, to be here to help you so that you could go and live with my Father as well someday. And you can't give up your stinky camel. You can't give up your stuff for that. But Jesus didn't say that. You see, what we value will guide our lives. What we value will guide our lives. The man valued his wealth, and as a result, he chose wealth over eternal life. The man was, was, we, that we studied last week in the story of the Good Samaritan, he had a neighbor problem. This man had a value problem. Love gives. Love sacrifices. There's nothing more valuable than a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the big question to wrap things up today is this. What value is guiding your life? In this story, we see that love gives and love sacrifices. We see the same in our lives today in, 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 in multiple areas, from the smallest to the biggest. When I was a little boy, uh, I was the first, first grandchild, grandson, of course. And when I went to my grandmother's house, uh, when we sit down to eat, and now fried chicken was a staple. But they didn't get fried chicken at Walmart. There were no Walmarts then. She got fried chicken from the backyard. That's where our fried chicken came from. And they cut up their own chicken. It wasn't pre-cut like they do today and mess it up. And uh, they, they had a piece of chicken called the pullet bone. Now, some of you younger people, you can Google that. And, and it's, it's like a wishbone thing. And it's just covered with white breast chicken meat. And it was the creme de la creme 
of fried chicken. And nobody, you don't reach for the pullet bone when little Gary Lynn was sitting at the table. Because <laughs> Mamaw's going to make sure that Gary Lynn got the pullet bone. Because that was the best of the best. And then when you ate all of the, all of the meat off of it, you'd have somebody under the table get on one end and on the other. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And you pull it and it would break. And if I remember right, the one that had the longest was going to get married first. Is that right? Some, huh? Something like that. Or go to jail first. I don't know which one. Something like that. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> and uh, see, see, those are memories. But, but it, was, it, was, it was a value thing. It was a value. If there's one piece of pie left, mom's not going to eat the piece of pie. Mom's going to make sure her kids get the piece of pie. See, it's a va- what do you value the most in life? And what you value, what you value will make the decisions in your life. It, it, it affects your decision making. And this is true in any area, whether it's in our families, our jobs, our friendships, our church family. Love gives, love sacrifices. Jesus gave. Jesus sacrificed his life so that you and I could have life today. And no sacrifice in our life compares to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Nothing, nothing compares to that sacrifice. You know, when Rose and I, um, we, we began in youth ministry when we were teenagers, really. It's a little church. They only had about four or five people and, and kids, that is, teenagers. And we all went to high school together. And when we graduated high school, we became the youth leaders at a little church. Now, you've heard me say before that I grew up in church. My dad's here today. I'm so glad he's here. And uh, I've said I had a drug problem growing up. Uh, my mom and daddy drugged me to church. And I'm glad they did. And as a result of that, I got a lot of word on the inside of me. Times when I didn't want to go. Uh, didn't want to go, didn't want to go, didn't want to go, but they, they took me to church anyway. It wasn't an option, and I'm glad that they did and reinforced that value because what, what they were saying was it's important to us. And uh, parents, here's a little sidebar. Uh, what's important to you will transfer down to your children, and if serving God's not important to you, it won't be important to them when they grow up. Uh, and if you go, you know, once a month and it's no big deal and you don't have, you know, it's no big deal, sir. You know, we go to church when we want to. You're imprinting in them as well that it's not a big deal to you. And I promise you it'll be no deal to them in the next generation. Okay, back on today's message. So, and as our young teenagers and Rose and I got married at age 18. And then we were the youth leaders at this church. And we were faithful in doing everything the church wanted. And there was a call of God on our life at that time. And Rose knew it probably more than me. And I just denied it. And uh, just uh, I didn't want to do it, quite frankly. I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't, I didn't, there weren't any preachers I knew that I wanted to grow up and be like, quite frankly. That I didn't want to be that guy. And uh, that, that's, that's why I was entrepreneurial and, and I wanted to have a business and I wanted to make money and I wanted to fund the church and, and all of those dreams and things I had. But still, we, we had a youth service every week and, and we helped out and we taught Sunday school and, and uh, we didn't call it a worship, the worship team back then. We called it the song service. And you didn't dare call the musicians a band. Uh, but so we, so I, I helped in the in the music and, and, and things like that. And, and everything that they needed, we did. We worked, we worked, we worked, we worked for 10 years. We worked, we worked, did everything that they needed and just best volunteers in the church gave not only tithes and offerings and missions giving and, and, and raised thousands of dollars through our youth for youth missions things and things like that. But, but it was all to appease God. I was like the rich young ruler, only I was, I was only young. And, and, and I, I, I had, what I loved was not that. Uh, I did it. I, I, was, I obeyed God. I, I wanted, I want to be a good Christian young man. I wanted to serve the Lord. I want to do what was right. I knew what was right. I've been taught and I, and I knew rules and I understood that. And I want to do, I was, I was saved. I mean, I was, I, you know, I was born again, but, but I, that's not what I valued. I valued my dream. I valued my goals. I valued what I want to do. And finally, it was a point in time in my life at age 27 where God brought it all around. And just like with this rich young ruler, he looked at me and says, you need to do something. You need a drastic change in your life. 
You need to get rid of everything you have and come and follow me. It's like God drawed a line in the sand and said, today, you're going to step over that line. How many of you men here today, when you were growing up on the playground, there were times when some other old boy said, step over that line. Anybody here beside me? Now, how many of you drew the line and dared them to step over it? You're ready, aren't you? But if somebody drew that line with all your buddies looking at you and you're on this side, I don't care if he's as big as King Kong, you better step over that line. I mean, you may get a whooping, but it would be worse if you don't step over that line, the peer pressure. And so you step over that line. Have you ever had a guy say, now step over this line? <laughs> you got him then. You, you got him now. Yeah, you just, yeah, yeah. Draw me another one, boy. I mean, you've, you've got him going now. And God just like drew a line in the sand and said, okay, you, you, I'm, I'm, you got to step over this line. You, you need to sell all you have, Literally. Get rid of everything you have and come and follow me. And that's tough, especially when you have a lot. But the biggest thing you have is your dream. Sell it. Get rid of it. Bury it. That's not my dream for you, son. I'm very thankful that at that juncture in my life, even at a previous juncture, I said no. No, I'm going to keep my stuff. At that juncture, I said yes. Did it hurt? Beyond words. Beyond words. Is it tough? You betcha. Is it difficult? Yeah. Is it worth it? <laughs> Absolutely. What's eternal life worth? You know, there's a group of billionaires right now who are, uh, have joined their, their, their resources together. They're spending billions of dollars on research. They have their own research team, research facility. And you know what their goal is? To figure out how they can have eternal life. How they can live forever. They can come up with a serum or a vaccination or, or a drink or, or something that would cause the body to rejuvenate and regenerate. By the way, do you know that our body re rejuvenates? So, and I forget how many hours or days uh, new cells and everything are replacing. So why do we get old? I mean, we shouldn't because it's creating new cells all the time. Why do we get old? Because of a little thing called sin. Because God created Adam and Eve to never die. That's why he said, the day you eat of that, you start dying. And the day they had that fruit, they started the death process in our bodies. And these old boys and gals can spend billions of dollars if they want to, but they're never going to come up with anything when really they don't have to spend anything. All they've got to do is go to the Word of God and find out somebody's already figured it out. His name is Jesus. And through Jesus, we can have eternal life. Let me ask the question again. What do you value that's causing you to make the decisions you're making? And when you think about it, if you just stop and think about it, every decision that you make in life pretty much is based on what you're valuing. You may not be able to answer that question in depth right now, but if you'll think about it, you'll chew on it, you'll meditate on it a little bit. Every, every decision that you're making, no matter what stage you are in life and season of life you're in, what you value. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying what you value will, will, will help you or it will guide you. It, it will really will shape you. you. You will. It will determine your decision making, what you value value. You value your family. You value your job. You value your career. You value your hobby. You value Jesus. You value His Word. You know, there have been times in our lives, and that's something you have to revisit throughout your life, by the way. It's not something that you do once in life, boom, bam, I'm done. Throughout seasons of your life, there, that question rises up again as we are at major tipping points in our lives. What do you value? There have been times in our life in Rose and I that through, uh, you know, serving God in the church and even here in this church and ministering, we've been here this year in the fall, it's going to be 28 years. 
And there've been times through that, that where we've had to say to God, it's on the altar. It's all yours. It's not ours. You just gave us stewardship to oversee it for a period of time. When you're done, we're done. We walk away. It's yours. It all belongs to you, Jesus. And there've been times when we wondered, God, are, are, you, are, you, are you through with us here? Are you through? And, and, and uh, it's been funny to me sometimes. We went through a season one time where uh, people were, were, were thought, they're kind of accusing me of trying to take control of stuff and doing some different things. By the way, somebody's going to be in charge here. Might as well be me. Let's get that settled, okay? But, but being in charge and controlling everything is two different things. See? See, I'm just in charge of the team. I'm in charge of the team to lead the team. That's it. That's just the role that I'm in right now. But we all bring something to the team. We're all working together. I don't have all the ideas. We got a lot of ideas. I just help implement them. I'm just here to lead. I'm just the coach of the team. And when Jesus wants a new coach, he get a new coach. But it's funny when people, I've been accused from time to time, of, well, he wants to be in control. It's, he wants to take control of this. I don't want to control anything except my mouth. And I got a scripture in Proverbs that helps me with that, that I shared with you earlier. But, but that's really the main thing I want to control in my life and just love Jesus and love people and do life together because it all belongs to him and it's all going to pass away someday. And someday I'm going to be with him in eternity and none of this is going to matter. And the kind of lawnmower you have won't matter. And the kind of motorcycle you ride doesn't matter. And the type of this and car you drive, it won't. I don't think we're going to walk on the streets of glory and say, dude, what kind of car did you have? <laughs> car? What's a car? You're going to meet somebody that went to heaven and double alt four or something, you know, in, in the first century or something like car was a car. It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. That's what's going to matter. What matters in your life right now? What matters? Father, I thank you for my family. And Lord, I think you have posed an important question today a very important question to all of us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, over the next few days, starting right now, that you will, you will begin to stir this in each of our hearts and lives for us to really get our value system in the right order. Lord, you're not against us having things. That's, that's not what the message is about. It's about things having us. It's about external things controlling our decisions when really our decisions should be based on our relationship with you. Help my family, every individual, every single adult, every married couple, every individual going through a struggle right now. God, help each of us, Lord, to evaluate with your help, Holy Spirit, of what we value and make sure that our value system is in line with your word, Lord. Because love gives and love sacrifices. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing for us so that we could have what you have given to us. Amen.